to examining the Christian faith series here. Hope everyone's doing well. Let me get my comments still here set up. Hey, Kim, thank you for joining. Appreciate it. I hope everything's going good. Trying to get, it's been, it's been a busy weekend, to say the very least, <clears throat> with children and, and uh, uh, watching some uh, super motocross uh, racing. Very intense last night. We didn't get to sleep till late and had some baseball game and uh, that morning. And, and then today we've been wide open as well. And um, so, but other than that, I hope everyone is doing good. Just, okay. So we're going to be going over, this is a second lecture part of the series. We're going to be going over the uh, Big Bang and creation. So it should be rather interesting. I do believe I have a slide set up here. And um, I've been working on it for the past week, so it should be good. All right, we'll go ahead and start with the word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord God, Jesus Christ, uh, thank you for this time together. Please bless this uh, study, Lord, and help us to delve deeper into your word and uh, to look at it at different angles and to uh, digest that and to seek to integrate it and into our minds and hearts and to... Um, ultimately enhance our understanding of your word, understanding of you, Lord, and help us to continue to come closer to you and closer to each other and help each other and pray for one another. Uh, continue to be with us and strengthen us, fill us with the Holy Spirit, cleanse from our sin. In your great name, pray, Lord Jesus Christ, Father in heaven. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> so, trying to get my thoughts gathered here. I rushed in here. Give me a little swimming and all kinds of different things with children okay so last last week we went over the power of ideas and um how ideas you know drive drive our behavior and our actions sometimes to good things and, and sometimes to reprehensible acts such as those found within the gulags of soviet union or or even those of Nazi Germany and Mao China and, and the like. And uh, we even have seen that even within the Christian church, uh, such ideas um, that drove the Crusades, for instance. That was more political drive than it was uh, religious. Uh, although most people are like, oh, we'll see Christians do horrible things. Like, that's true. All sorts of different people do horrible things. But at the same time, that's not exactly what the teachings of Christ and the apostles represent whatsoever um so you got to get to the underlying belief of the system itself to understand um the behavior being exhibited i would say so and we were looking at dual hemisphere and looking at the left and right um perceptions within the hemisphere uh, domain of the brain and how they function differently. And it's very fascinating, the work of Ian McGilgoresh and how the right hemisphere sees the whole of the context and left hemisphere is more based off precision and takes things out of context. And they're both essential, um, but it appears that the right seems to be more of, let's say, he called it more of the master while the left hemisphere is more of the emissary. And um, we take in information more through the right, send it over to the left, seek to integrate it into the current model, the knowledge structure that we have housed uh, that ultimately kind of help drive perception um, and also help us uh, analyze things, analyze behaviors of other people, emotions of other people to a certain extent. Uh, but that, that's also done through both hemispheres, but we can become so overactive on the left hemisphere front. And then that seems to be a modern phenomenon that's happening as well, that we ultimately um, take things out of context, view people as uh, objects rather than and truly uh, people, persons, human. We dehumanize them to the left and uh, we seek to impose ideas and 
fantasies that we construct the models within our left hemisphere upon reality. And we see a lot of that happening both on the right and left uh, spectrum of, of the political sphere. You see that with certain ideas that they've constructed these fantasies within their heads. So, um, and then we looked at uh, Frederick Nietzsche and we looked at the different ideas that drove people to do certain actions, even that of Christ. And we saw how sometimes it can be uh, an honorable act to go beyond the realm of, of a society's current system of belief and expand upon that. And that's, that's what we saw with um, Martin Luther. And uh, as the Catholic Church had a hold on society and culture at that time, and he, he stretched beyond that and ultimately helped free um, a lot of people, a lot of systems, and ultimately uh, different countries implemented his ideas and, and did wonderful things in due process. And we see that with a bunch of different historical characters, it's, you know, especially that of Christ, of course, and the apostles and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, different people that went outside of societal norms and um, implemented new refreshing ideas that done society good. And then we see people that also stretch outside the societal norms to implement reprehensible ideas that of Marxism for one. Uh, we saw that with Karl Marx and how he promoted these ideas of um, the inequality that was embedded within society and and you could say at one um, at one aspect, looking at one one perception, he's correct that there's inequalities, and maybe we need to do something about that. Uh, but the way in which he went about the solution he provided was uh, nothing but rooted in resentment and retaliation, and nothing good comes from that. That's essentially the Luciferian idea uh, in and of itself. Uh, that's a very ancient idea. And he promoted that, and, and we saw the catastrophes that emerged from those belief systems. We saw that within uh, Mao, China, and uh, Soviet Union. And, and, um, and so there, there can be devastating impact from different ideas. So we have to be careful. It's, it ultimately, it's, it's what it more or less summing it up from last week is getting precise in your belief. What do you mean? especially as Christians, what do you mean by that you believe in Christ and that you believe the Christian values and that you believe in the Holy Spirit and you believe in the forgiveness of sins and all these different things. And even in, in the Old Testament and the Old Testament God and the, uh, the law itself and, and creation and, and uh, the Exodus. And, eh, you know, and I think in the church, and I said last week, in the church, unfortunately, our modern day church, not to, uh, overgeneralize necessarily, but I think we're focused too much on helping people feel better about themselves, too much of the encouragement side rather than actually, excuse me, informing and addressing issues within the Christian church and helping people learn, educating people within the church. That's, that's essentially how the Christian church was set up in the first place. And so, um, what it's done too is the fact that we got away from education and got more into the aspects of encouragement and the so-called quote unquote love, which we'll get on later on in the series about what exactly do you mean by love? Whenever you ask people these questions, uh, it really, you could say playing the devil's advocate. And again, this goes based off of the left hemisphere model. People have this model constructed and it always needs to be updated, but it gets to the point where people solidify the model and then they believe that, that that's it. That's all that should go because the rest of it's uncomfortable to them and, and they don't want to get outside the comfort zone. And so as soon as you, uh, what the right hemisphere does is it plays the devil's advocate. Are you sure about that? Is that the whole of the context? Are you sure the situation and your perception of that situation is adequate? Maybe you need to do a little bit more work. And so if we do that to ourselves, it ultimately helps. And if we do that with a, each other, if we dialogue and communicate, not debate, but dialogue and communicate with each other within the church, uh, we would see a lot more growth, I believe. Could be wrong. But um, as simple as the ideas of love, what do you mean? I mean, most people can't even specify what they mean by love. They're like, well, love, you know, just caring for others and and 
um, encouraging each other. And it's like, well, yeah, that's one aspect of love. But there's a duality of love, just like the duality with everything uh, within the nature of being itself. Uh, we see that what I was saying, well, the dual hemispheres for one. Uh, we saw that with uh, the particle wave duality um, of reality of the subatomic realm. And we'll go into a little bit more of that as well today and how there's always this dual aspect of, of being and that uh, love itself is, is, it has a dual nature. It has, even as parenting, you do not constantly encourage your child. You also have to discipline, discipline them to a certain extent. And you have to figure out what that is. And that, that's a difficult thing to do as well. But you, you have to, there are rules and there's boundaries and um, really boundaries are set in place out of love. And if you don't care about your kid, you don't set any boundaries. You just let them run amok and don't guide them. And, and, you know, there's psychological literature is clear on that. that and I believe I touched on that last week that you too much tyranny and too much disciplinary action causes a lot of mental illness problems and physical problems later on in life or, as the child grows into adults, same thing on the on the uh, too liberal side. If you end up allowing them to have too much freedom, no rules, no guidance, they grow up in confusion. And and, and it's, it's pretty clear studies have been conducted on this. So it's the middle path. There's that middle path going back to the Buddhist idea, as well as that with which is found in Christianity itself. That it's every, in everything have balance, and um, and so you know. Love itself is a balanced nature. God loves us, but he, we're, we're his children. And so he's going to have a disciplinary aspect as well, not just an encouraging aspect. And so it's not all grace, you know, just like it's not all faith. It's also works. Um, that would be, quote unquote, part of the disciplinary um, uh, aspect, I would say, the tyr tyrannical part, uh, and that of action. And, um, and so there, there's always... There's that dichotomy that's constantly going on and we have to be aware of that. And, you know, and I, I, again, too, with, with the ideas of not educating within the Christian church, even that on the historical front of understanding, I mean, now most of the church, uh, they're, uh, especially on the younger generational side, do not believe in Noah's flood. Uh, don't believe that the Exodus happened. Uh, don't believe that, um, the story of creation and, and Genesis was a real thing. Uh, they believe that it's just um, strictly poetic and um, they're just stories. And we derive meaning from those stories. And, and they're actually correct in part. That's only one part of it. Again, the dichotomy situation, dichotomy of perception going on there, um, of information being presented to us. It's like, yeah, no, you're, you're right. And and oftentimes that's what Christian church does as well. Is they take things and they're like, well, it's strictly um you know, it's uh, yeah, when I'm trying to think, like I said, we've had a busy week, a uh, weekend and week as well, but weekend, my goodness. And so I'm trying to uh, wrap my head around here. I'm having my energy drink, but it's just slowly but surely kicking in. And, um, uh, but yeah, there, there's this type of information embedded within the stories that give us meaning and there's strictly meaning. It's like, no, no, there's factual elements to this as well that we have to observe. And, uh, you know, I think, as far as an atheistic um, Christian uh, kind of, I would, uh, I'm trying to think of the word exactly here, confrontation going on is that that's where they're beating Christians out of. It's like, okay, well, it's strictly meaning. It's like, well, you can get that from anything. People get meaning from, from fictional stories all the time. It doesn't necessarily have to come from the Bible if we're going to go that route. And so you got to be kind of precise on what you mean by that. And so, my effort here is to really delve deep into the Christian faith. And, you know, this is the second of 10 lectures and I, I really want to go. I've been meaning to do this for quite some time and I, I feel somewhat adequate now, not entirely adequate, but um, I uh, felt like it was the right time to really expound on this. And, I, you know, we're going to go through creation and um, story of creation embedded with science. Uh, today we'll go into consciousness next week and self-awareness and um, and the fall itself and and we're going to be looking at archaeological historical evidence and trying to make sense of this the best that we can. It's not that I'm I'm not necessarily I would say providing answers. It's just more or less here's some evidence. Maybe this is you know we can draw some conclusions here a little bit. Maybe 
but we can at least say there's enough evidence, you know, supporting our case that this is real. It's a real deal. Christianity is real, and it's not something um, that we just derive meaning from. It, it's something authentically real that we can believe in and, and move through and, and truly take serious. Um, so it's not just some game or some created idea uh, like Marxism or or the ideas promoted by various different philosophers. It's, this is a true, authentic, embedded with reality itself and, and goes beyond that. So um, we'll look at Old Testament history. We'll look at Exodus later on in the series to understand how real that may or may not be. And I believe it's much older story than than what traditional dating has. And we'll go into some different evidences, which makes the story even that much more authentic, I would say. Um, so anyways, I will actually get carried on here. So I have a few comments. I just want to touch on those right quick. Amen, Joe. Very true. Spirit of truth will lead us into all truth. And this will offend both non-believers and believers alike who can't let go of their preconceived ideas and what their traditions have taught him. Exactly. And that's what we went over last week is the idea of the tradition and progressive and what you mean by that and how they both go together. They're both right and wrong at the same time. And we have to figure out it's not, and it's not easy. It's something that and it takes a community of believers to come together to work these problems out. And it's never going to be perfect. That's for sure. And that's not what I'm promoting, but I am promoting that we need to really seriously think on what we're teaching in churches and, and that maybe we need to expand beyond the borders. And I don't mean expand beyond the borders into chaos, like what some of these uh, more liberal churches are, are promoting. I mean, scientifically speaking and integrating science, science and factual information and trying to make sense of all this. Um, that's true progress in and of itself. So, Unlike almost uh, must our faith be evolved in every aspect does the Lord say his work is important, but it is good to have friends. Exactly, absolutely. No, I agree. Uh Johnny Smith, um fun in there, so that was our faith. Yeah, our faith should be involved in every aspect of our life to a certain degree. I mean, it's not something you talk about all the time, that's for sure. You know, we talk about all sorts of different things. We have all sorts of different hobbies, you know. Um, but I think it's in and everybody has a different level. Uh, you know, just like Paul was stating, uh, I believe it was in Corinthians, where he says that, you know, not all of the hand, not all are the feet, you know, of the body of Christ. We all have different uh, areas to partake in. My really, my goal here is to deliver this message to um, fellow Christians to help educate, but also to help instigate some thoughts within Christian leaders. Um, within the church that are teaching, you know, your teachers, you need to take this stuff serious. And we need to really be looking at this. If you're a true teacher, if you're not, it's something that, you know, you can take into consideration and learn something and grow from there, you know, and maybe talks amongst each other and grow. It depends on where you're at, but especially for teachers, as it says multiple times, you know, teachers have a greater condemnation. We need to be taking this stuff serious. Um, and so I, you know, no, it's, uh, you know, some people go deeper than others, and that's okay. It's just fine. It depends on where you're set within the body of Christ. Not all are capable of even going to certain depths, you know. And we all have uh, different gifts and abilities to administer, uh, to exhibit, and to, you know, bless, be a blessing to other people. And so my thing here is to educate and to also help instigate some thought within um, within Christian leaders and Christian teachers to, hey, you know, this, we need, these are things to consider. That's for sure. And then kind of go from there. So, all right. So we're going to look here. All right. So we got, we're going over creation and the big bang. I hope that was helpful on that end, by the way. <laughs> hope I explained that adequately. Creation, evolution. And these are some quotes, not from Christian thinkers, but rather from uh, atheists and, uh, uh, yeah, so agnostics, I would say. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Richard Feynman, a famous physicist I've mentioned a couple of times here. 
At the rate of expansion, one second after the Big Bang had been smaller, even uh, one part in 100,000 million million, it would have re-collapsed before it reached its present size. On the other hand, if it had been greater by a part in a million, the universe would have expanded too rapidly for stars and planets to form. That's from Stephen Hawking. And he's talking about the cosmological constant and how everything in the universe appears to be so finely tuned that if it was off even to the a fraction of a degree, um, it, nothing would even exist in and of itself. So uh, the universe itself seems to be, um, I would say, programmed to a certain extent to be in a state of balanced equilibrium to function or operate properly. If it was any off by the least bit, whether too great or too large, things would not even exist. The universe would either collapse or would inflate too quickly and burst. So um, it's very interesting. That goes back again to uh, the ideas of balance, uh, even within the individual life. And we even see that within embedded within reality as such that balance is key. There has to be a state of equilibrium, a, home, a state of homeostasis. It goes on. Even the, even the earth does that. You see that with the climate change ideas being promoted, of course. Um, and of course I can go into that later on, maybe towards the end of this uh, series with, with the end time notion. Uh, once we get into the end time, second coming of Christ, that if you look, at the past 500,000 years of CO2 and temperature fluctuations, they're pretty consistent and uh, showing that the, the earth is constantly going to states of equilibrium, going through that of homo, it's re trying to reach the state of homeostasis all the time, just like our bodies. And it appears that the universe is so finely tuned, it, it operates in, in somewhat of the same fashion. Um, and we'll get into some of this, but I like the Richard Feynman quote as well, because it doesn't matter how beautiful your model that you have constructed, your tradition or whatever it may be, or how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiments, if it doesn't agree with what the facts are presented as such, then it's obviously wrong. And to disagree with that means that you're so possessed with those ideas that we have a rather large problem going on. And you see that it doesn't matter whether it's Christians or atheists, they do the same thing and uh, on radical ends. Now there's, and what I'm proposing is the fact of keeping an open mind, looking at the data and then seeing how that maps on. And uh, so, yeah. So a universe that came from nothing in the Big Bang will disappear into nothing at the Big Bang. It's glorious few zillion years of existence, not even a memory, it's Paul Davies. And uh, it's interesting though, he's talking about a beginning and an end of the universe, what the Bible promotes as well. Uh, into, uh, will disappear into nothing at the big crunch. What's fascinating about that is the fact that most physicists are beginning to agree with the idea of a big crunch. That is the collapse of the universe onto itself. And what people, what some physicists have come out here recently, and I think I have it in here actually, we've gone over the idea of dark energy helping be a large proponent of the collapse of the universe upon itself which agrees right with what's found within, uh, I believe it's second Peter. It might have been, I think it's second Peter uh, chapter two or three. It talks about the coming of Christ and talks about the dissolving of the elements, and the burning up of the universe. And that's exactly what happens in the big crunch scenario. The universe collapses back into the singularity, burning everything up and re-emerging into a new universe. And that's, uh, the new universe is, and, uh, it's, Reference within uh, mentioned within Second Peter as well as in um, uh, Revelation. Sorry, my thoughts. Okay, says so we are in the product of four and a half billion years of fortunateness, slow biological evolution. There's no reason to think that the evolutionary process has stopped. Man is a transitional animal. He is not the climax of creation. Uh, that's from Carl Sagan, uh, which is interesting. That, I just like that um, because we are not supposed to, especially if you actually look at the evolution, the human evolution in particular, and you look at how we progress, we're almost in a process of regression, uh, evolutionarily speaking. And I think that is a rather large problem to be having as a species. And I think what Christ has taught 
we'll get into it later on. I've even spoken on some of my previous videos with the ideas of transformation. Um, we're, we're, we're supposed to constantly, we should be representing that same developmental stage within our own lives as, as individuals um, because we kind of mimic that, especially consciously, brain development, everything from the time that we're uh, conceived and, you know, conceived and, and birthed and developed and, and develop into adults. We follow kind of an evolutionary pathway. It has the same representation, representational pattern going on there. And we should constantly continue to grow. There should never be a stop. But we allow culture to kind of dictate that we, you know, get old. And, I, you know, and it's fascinating, too, because we can actually, um, to a certain degree, slow down aging just by our thoughts. Uh, they conducted experiments like this uh, with people that, in, in comparison, and I saw it here recently, there, there's, and these are legitimate studies that conducted with people that have a perception that they're still young as they age, and then people that perceive themselves as old, and the people that perceive themselves as old, just by the sheer thought and perception, not even controlling for other variables like diet, uh, things of that nature, age much rapid uh, much more rapidly than than people that had a perception that they were young and kept active kept themselves going and had a young frame of mind just by sheer thoughts alone now you add that with the ideas of, of good health and eating plenty of uh, uh antioxidant rich foods and and getting plenty of sun and, and movements and things of that nature which should constantly be continuously transforming and evolving even as we age there should never be but we have this, especially in modern day age, we have this idea embedded within us that, that well, you work, you get old, you retire, and then you die. And, you know, there's, it's like, no, no, you should constantly be evolving. You're constantly transforming. You should, you know, it's not just a one-stop shop kind of thing. That's not what it's meant to be. And that's even the Christian uh, teachings, you know, teach us that. There's continual transformation and ascension to new levels in our life both consciously and physically, and there should not be um, anything that that hinders that for that that we pursue, I would say. So anyway, all right, first thing that we're going to get into here, to begin with, much of the work that I'm going to be referring to is that of uh, uh, Dr. Gerald uh, Schroeder, like I said, I always pronounces, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it incorrect, but Schroeder, and I'll get to his book and picture him and, and we'll go through some of his work here shortly. The first thing before we begin on our journey here is the fact that there are different words that are being used. Create is only used, uh, created. And only used in Genesis 1, if I'm not mistaken, three different times. And that's the universe itself. Um, that's uh, the uh, sea creatures, uh, the animals. And I'm not even sure of the animals. We'll, we'll see it as we go, but uh, humans. Uh, so you only, you only have it about three different times. Three or four different times. There. And the rest of it's actually made. Even that with, in, in reference to uh, the sun itself, sun and moon are not um, created, uh, they're made, which they're different words in Hebrew. And I'm hoping, that, let me know if you cannot see it or can see it. Uh, I tried doing my best trying to format this thing and I still have not figured out how to get the, uh, blow this up larger as an actual slideshow over onto my other screen. I'm not as tech savvy as, as some, so. Um, but you have Hebrew or bara which means to create shape form um, it's, it's always used generally uh, something from, from nothing almost. Um, so create like feed, choose. And then you have Asa, which is made uh, to fashion, to do fashion, accomplish, make, produce. Uh, but it's generally uh, something that's already pre-existing that you're shaping and forming, you're utilizing itself. It's what it's in reference to. Uh, to do, to make, uh, execute, uh, perform, maintain, prepare, address. So it's something that's already kind of there that you're uh, working with, something that's pre-existing, essentially. So Asa, made, and bara, 
created. So that's the, I wanted to make that clear as we began this journey to understand that not every single thing that, you know, everybody's like, oh yeah, God created the sun. Well, no, the word used there is actually also Hebrew um, made uh, something that's pre-existing. And, and Daryl Schroeder does a great job at, at uh, making that clear in his book that it's the use of something that's already there. Um, and so we'll see how that actually flows uh, within the cosmic evolution and how to make sense of that scientifically speaking, as well as scripturally speaking, how exactly would that make sense if the sun and moon are already there? And, you know, he just made them using pre, what, what does that mean exactly? So we'll, we'll uh, delve into that here in a second. So here's the big bang from the quantum fluctuations of the singularity and uh, going outward you have the afterglow pattern 375,000 years ago, a, a temporary dark ages. The first stars appear finally about 400 million years after the, first, uh, after the initial Big Bang. And like I said, all of these properties are finely tuned in the system itself in order for things to um, uh, form properly. Otherwise, nothing would have formed if things were off just slightly the whole system would have collapsed. So th this is an intelligent system, very intelligent system that we inhabit. And uh, we'll go into even more of the intelligence factor here soon with that of the sub subatomic realm and so on. So we had the um, Big Bang it goes on for, we're at about 13.7 billion years into the cosmic evolution pattern. And some of the recent estimations of dark energy collapse may be as little as anywhere from 65 to 100 million years from now, the universe may collapse upon itself through the workings of dark energy. So we'll get into that here shortly. It's very fascinating. Um, which in cosmic terms, that's not very long at all. And um, the work of General you know, Scott is just really fascinating because he, he talks about the cosmic Microwave, microwave background radiation being a cosmic universal clock that we can use. And that's, um, we still see the remnants of that in the background, the echo of the Big Bang and, and how as, as the stretching of space time uh, emerged from the singularity, from that Big Bang, initial Big Bang process, that time itself and the wave frequency of the cosmic microwave background radiation extended and time itself extended. Um, and we're looking back in time from the standpoint of where we are 13.7 billion years. But according to the cosmic background radiation, my cosmic microwave background radiation and um, the frequencies and, and uh, oh, what was it as well? It's so a radiation and temperature itself um if you were to look at it from the initial point it would almost appear as though it's only been a few days that have passed kind of correlating that with genesis now he does a lot better job at explaining it than i do it's very complex stuff and uh, he was like i said he got, had a doctorate from mit in phys physics which is one of the number one is the number one uh physics uh school in the world so that's where he got his degree from he has a degree as well in biology so that's why he, that's good at uh speaking of evolution as well on his part in his book and he has a few other books as well but so day one the big bang in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of god was hovering over the face of the waters and, the, and then god said let there be a light and there was light and god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness god called the light day and the darkness he called night so the evening and the morning were the first day and at this particular point, people get stumped on the fact, well, first of all, it says the earth was without form and void. And he referenced it more towards the universe itself. And we'll go into that here shortly um, at the initial process of the Big Bang shortly thereafter. And that the darkness and void and um, the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. He was speaking, uh, uh, man, I'm trying to explain some of it. I have the deal on here, but... Um, some of the initial properties of the essence of reality just after shortly thereafter the big bang and that the light itself is actually the separations of uh, protons 
uh, or photons from antiphotons, I believe, to where light first emerged shortly thereafter the Big Bang. And uh, this is where it comes into play. So we'll, we'll delve into it a little bit deeper here in a second. So this is the Science of God book, Gerald Schroeder. And uh, he um, he died, I believe, 2015 or 16, maybe a little bit after that. Oh, uh, but he, he was a brilliant, brilliant guy. And this is his work right here with separations of the day, the genesis itself. These are things to consider. That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm not saying these are 100% facts that you should believe them. This is correct interpretation. Presenting these ideas and let people kind of digest the information, see how it fits in the current model of understanding. Uh, but it is something to take into consideration. And so I'm not sure. Hopefully you guys can see it fairly well. Uh, so day one is uh, started the year. Um, yeah, so he does it about 16 billion years, and these are estimates, even 13.7 billion years an estimate. And so he estimates more on the 16 billion year standpoint and um, viewpoint. And so the first day is actually billions of years. And as time began to stretch itself, it actually slows down the processes of the, of the actual days themselves as well. So the days and the years actually shorten by the stretching of space and time itself. Very fascinating. Um, so it, it day one in the end of the day is literally right at, uh, well, right at seven to eight billion, or it's eight billion years. Um, so a long time span, but that's the initial process. You know, it's fast acting and then it slows itself down. Now I'm having some virus window security threat protection. I'm good. Okay. So it said the creation of the universe, light separates from darkness. Uh, scientific description is the Big Bang marks the creation of the universe. Light literally breaks free as electrons bond to atomic nuclei. Galaxies start to form within that time frame. And so that's where light and the actual visible universe begins to emerge. And that's a process of 8 billion years just in one day of time. And it's all moving rather rapidly at that point. The universe itself has it, you know, big bang happens. Everything happens rather rapidly. And um, so, yeah, we're going to work through this. This is very complicated stuff for the most part. And uh, I'm not even sure what that is. You know, hell, how are we going to today? A nuclear bomb explodes in the city of Chicago, which will be seven years long. Most of you should be marked with Satan. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's interesting, man. Very interesting comment. That's all I can say. You shall soon be in hell. Hell begins the day a nuclear bomb explodes in the city of Chicago and shall be seven years long. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it. That's interesting. March 20. You all have no breath. I know him. We're attacked by Satan. You're bad. Satan spoke in your brains on television. Okay, well, I'm not really sure what that means, but okay. Um, so this, so the ideas of day in Hebrew, this is something out that people don't understand. Um, within much of the interpretation, I was talking about the same thing with, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Kim Ham. That if you were going to look at Genesis as literal, then yes, I guess you could take it, take it as days and. But like I said, the, if you're going to take it as such, um, I'm not sure exactly how you would get 24-hour days to begin with because there's no sun. The sun doesn't, it isn't even created or made until uh, day four, as we'll see here shortly. So that doesn't really make any sense. Not including the fact that the Hebrew word yom can be translated as day, a literal day, and is, but it's also, uh, it can also be translated as time, chronicles, daily, ever, year, continually. Um, it has, uh, it can be age. So age of, of the universal days could be billions of years. So it's, it can be translated day, not including the fact that Genesis one doesn't appear to be necessarily, um, it has, it doesn't necessitate a literal translation because it appears more poetic in nature. And so whenever it appears poetic, even chapters two and three are the same thing. And then it begins to kind of branch itself out from there. 
uh, to kind of have more literal historical references, but the, um, the, sorry, the, the comment, I get off track here. The, as I said, two, if you're going to take it literal, and this is the fascinating thing by some of these uh, Christian leaders, uh, the thing I propose to play the devil's advocate is the fact that, you know, you can tell that Genesis 1 as well as 2 and 3 to a certain extent appear more poetic in nature. And so it has ambiguous type approaches that have to come to it to be able to properly understand it. And it's not something simple. These stories are layered on top of each other that we'll see more. I, I would say next time we'll see, but we'll see here as well, this study, but the next study we'll definitely see how they're layered on top of each other and how um, how complex these stories really could ultimately be. I don't know. These are just ideas that I'm presenting, but um, that if you're going to take it, and it's funny whenever you talk to uh, people about the same Christian leaders about what Jesus Christ proposed and moving mountains. Well, that's figurative. No, actually, it, you know, one thing, if you're going to not take it literally, if you're going to take it literally in Genesis 1, where it's apparently poetic in nature, uh, but then whenever he you get to more of a literal passage where he's literally saying, pointing at this mountain, you'll be able to say this mountain be thrown into the sea, and you're not going to take that as a literal suggestion. It's like, well, that, then you're contradicting yourself, ultimately. Uh, I think, really, you have it backwards. You need to approach Genesis 1 in a more ambiguous type nature and um, and approach it with this poetic uh, symbolism going on and look at the words and try to understand it and, and understand it within its context and within the scientific context and and then look at um, and, and then look at more literal uh, more literal suggestions by christ uh in a literal format of saying no there's something going on here he's literally actually talking about a telekinesis he's just telling he just casting out a demon which is a miracle in and of itself and then he's you know in the same time he just was transfigured on the mountain especially in matthew uh in the gospel of matthew he descends from the mountain he points at that mountain said you'll be able to say this mountain move from here to there and uh which is like i said it's a form of telekinesis and pretty much Jedi-like abilities, and it's not too far-fetched with healing people, raising people from the dead, and, you know, his apostles be able to do greater works than he is, which moving mountains would be a greater work, and so it's like, no, and that, that's a literal, you know, uh, implication that's going on. It's a literal, literal suggestion that Christ is making. It's not um, figurative at all, as far as I can tell, so I think and we'll go into that later on as well once we get into teachings of Christ. But, <clears throat> oh, there's, there's this is very complex stuff, and I'm trying to do my best to uh, articulate it properly, I would say, and explain it. I'll get that to him. Seal, very tired. It's been busy. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So the day can be a literal day, but it can also, and this is fascinating because I actually saw a documentary here recently from a friend of mine uh, that sent it over to me, going on the deal of young earth uh, creation's perspective, showing evidence, which the evidence wasn't uh, very ample in comparison to that of the evidence supporting evolution, cosmic evolution, and, you know, earth evolution, so on. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that struck me as odd is uh, a Hebrew scholar was saying, well, no, it's always used literally as the day. It's, it's a literal day. I'm like, well, no, actually it's not. This was, I was like, how do you make sense of that? And this is a prominent documentary. And um, I was like, it's, it's time, period, year, and it's translated as such on multiple different occasions. And it would, uh, on several different occasions, it'd be awkward to actually translate it as a literal day. Um, and it, you know, it's so... Translation is very vital, and it's very difficult, too, to translate uh, oftentimes. Okay, the conscious state of reality. I spoke a little bit about this last week. Very interesting. In the top left-hand corner here is quantum entanglement. Uh, particles are literally connected to one another across the universe. Um, you can affect a particle here that could affect a particle simultaneously, instantaneously, 
uh, 13 and a half billion light years away. And Albert Einstein was saying this is absolutely impossible because nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Even if you send information at the speed of light to something 13 and a half billion light years away, it would take 13 and a half billion light years to get there. Or it would take 13 and a half billion years to actually uh, for them to retrieve the information. It would actually take even longer because technically the universe itself is expanding at such a rate that you would never actually reach or go in the speed of light. You'd have to move faster. So it's a very, things are very complex in our universe. And to say that you have the answers and that, you know, it's just black and white. Well, again, that goes back to the left hemisphere perception and it's not exactly accurate. Um, it's taking things out of the context of the whole, the whole context here. Um, Again, the yin yang symbol, the middle way, the balance path, you have the dichotomy of reality itself, the dual nature that we see uh, in all of reality. And, and that was represented uh, exceptionally well and is time and time again through the double slit experiment, where they're shooting individual particles through uh, two slits, going through a backboard, and it was always making a wave like pattern. And um, so they're like, okay, particles are a wave. It's, you know, pretty evident. But then whenever they began, uh, and they were shooting them quite fast, I remember that's what it was. They were shooting them quite fast, making this wave-like pattern. So they began to shoot them individually, and it was still making a wave-like pattern. But it wasn't until they began to switch it around and observe it on the other side that of the, of the slit itself that it began to... Uh, and yeah, I'm trying my best to explain this because it's very complex stuff. What they what they noticed is that a particle did not actually go into a particle like state. It would always be a wave and come out a wave and, and you know go to the backboard as a wave until a conscious a conscious observer observed it. And so what they done here recently with the experiment is they had cameras set up. And they had a camera set up to observe the particles and the particles would be shot through and it would always be a particle. That is its reality, its actuality itself. Um, particles are what make everything up. It's the wave-like function that is potential and that the universe is, uh, and that's whenever, as far as I can tell, and Einstein hated this idea because uh, he said he didn't like the idea that if he wasn't looking at the moon, it wasn't really there. And so it's, that everything is potential until a conscious observer is around and interacting, communicating with reality itself. So this, this, that means that the universe and reality itself is made for conscious beings. This conscious itself, as far as we can tell, and it's made for conscious beings that communicate with it. And we communicate back and forth with reality and reality manifests itself. Um, otherwise, real, reality stays in a, in a state of potential and never becomes actuality. And um, so they, they were even going to trick the particles and shut the camera off. So they unplugged the camera. Well, the particles knew that they unplugged the camera and came out in a wave-like fashion, a, fa a wave function. And so um, showing that there is the potential that this universe itself is conscious on the subatomic level. And that's the fundamental essence of reality. And that that means that the universe is conscious and intelligent, and knowing when we're doing something, when we're not doing something, and interacting with it, and it interacts with us and manifests. It's the craziest thing. So this goes back to my idea that I proposed before with uh, that of people on the New Age side believing, well, it's a higher power, you know, or even on the atheistic side from one of the guys that I, did a debate video with uh, a few years ago, the proposing that the universe is made from unconscious mathematical formulas. And that's what actually produced this universe. I was like, well, so far from experimentation, we can tell that the universe appears conscious. So does that make sense that unconscious, unintelligent mathematical formulas, you know, non, and that's also, uh, I would say antisocial to a certain extent, antisocial formulas, create a sociable, conscious, intelligent universe for conscious, intelligent, sociable creatures to inhabit, to interact with it, to manifest itself into existence. 
Like that doesn't make any sense. It makes more logical sense to say that a higher intelligence, higher conscious being uh, that's sociable, interactive with its creation, created a sociable, conscious, intelligent universe for conscious, intelligent, sociable creatures to inhabit, to activate it into existence. And so um, that also puts a hamper on the ideas of um, new ageism, because new ageism is embedded and will it man, it actually stems from Buddhism first off. That's its ancient counterpart. Uh, it's ancient um, uh, origins, I would say, uh, stem from Buddhism. And it's the idea that it's a higher power of some sort, not necessarily conscious nor uh, interactive with this creation. It's just energy. And um, it's like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense, though, because the universe is conscious. The universe is intelligent. It's sociable. And we're sociable and we're intelligent and we're conscious. And, and through that interaction, you know, that sociability between us and reality manifesting itself, it makes sense that, that it would be a, a higher intelligent, sociable, interactive God, uh, you would say, conscious God, not some vague uh, spiritual essence, um, energy essence that would create the universe. That just doesn't logically follow. Uh, so then at that point, and what we'll do is we'll keep narrowing the scope down as we go along in this in the series is the fact of well what religion because if it if god is interactive he would speak to us somehow through uh, and we can look through religions through religious texts to understand who that um ultimate power would be the you know supreme being would be and as far as i can tell the vast majority of evidence uh, supports Christianity as being the true uh, God. And of course, that's stemming to Judaism. Um, but Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. And uh, and we'll go through and we'll, we'll kind of narrow that scope down, narrow the focus, get more precise in, in what we mean. And that's the thing too, when we talk to people, even the Christian church all the time, you know, if I believe in God, well, who is God? Well, I don't know, you know, and a lot of people are like, well, the higher power. It's like, what do you mean by that? You know, and if it's a higher power and it's, it, you know, like I said, the universe is sociable, we're sociable, we're interactive, communicating, you would think that something higher, that higher power, higher conscious, higher intelligence would also be sociable, creating a sociable universe, creating sociable creatures to inhabit, to communicate with it, to manifest into existence. So therefore, it's communicating, and, you know, the higher power would communicate with us um, uh, somehow through religions would ultimately be the case. And, and so you'd have to scour through the religion and see which one has the most evidence to support it. That would be the most true, the most plausible explanation um, of who the true God would be. And so uh, it's not so easy. It's not so straightforward, I would say. So this is kind of what I'm presenting here. Could the universe be a giant quantum computer down here? This is just fascinating to me. And I'll get into more of this next uh, on the next lecture because um, it deals with the ideas of uh our brain using quantum computing. And I talked about it here just recently um, on one of my, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was the I, the brain and IQ and consciousness uh, video that I'd done, little study that I'd done, where uh, our brains may be using quantum computing to actually generate consciousness. And uh, maybe this whole universe itself, this is actually from Nature, which is a prominent uh, science magazine. Uh, it's just an essay, of course, but they're uh, promoting, uh, promoting some of the ideas of, uh, that have been promoted here recently. Same thing with um, oh, Elon Musk saying that you know we more than likely live in a simulated reality. And it appears as such. I mean, even on the subatomic uh, realm with all the particles being entangled together, it makes a system and it appears as a system. So maybe... It's a higher te technology that's being used by God and the angelic beings and such to, to create and, and to utilize. We don't know. We don't know when, when all reality is. And, and it doesn't contradict the Bible's uh, presentation whatsoever. It, could, it contradicts uh, potentially our models we have constructed of interpretation that we have derived from, from the Bible, but not necessarily the Bible in its essence, a true authentic self. Um, so... Uh, we don't know how complex this really is. And as we go through, we'll see how complex 
things kind of are a little bit. It's not so easy. And, and so we need people to think. And I think what's happened, especially within the, uh, in, through the Enlightenment and as well as the 19th, especially in the 19th century and, and the emergent works of Frederick Nietzsche and the death of God. And he, he, like I said last week, it wasn't a triumph for him. Most people are like, oh yeah, God is dead. You know, it's like he, he didn't do that triumphantly. He was stating that now we kill religion, you know, Christianity in and of itself. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to become hyper. And he predicted we'll become hyper rational. So hyper uh, overactive left hemisphere will become systematic, illogical, and will commit reprehensible acts. And that's exactly what he predicted for the 20th century. And that's exactly what we saw. Um, we saw, you know, Stalin, millions upon millions of deaths through Stalin, Mao, and Hitler, and the like. And, and these are all generated by mostly hyper-rationalism. And so, anyway, so the universe itself could be a simulated uh, system. And we, we don't know. We don't know what technology the heavenly realm possesses. I mean, if we have technology like we do, and we're in the process of building quantum computer, which are just, God, just so vastly uh, advanced compared to even the most advanced supercomputers we have today. I mean, entirely. It's it's utilizing quantum mechanics to its fullest. Um, you know, what more technology does the higher dimensional realm of heaven have in its power rather than just floating little angels, uh, you know, flying little angels and, uh, you know, in a, uh, you know, floating clouds everywhere and the things that we've conjured up. Um, but yeah, a lot of the great minds have tended towards atheism. That's what I was getting at in that rationalism. But, you know, rationalism isn't the only way. It's a dual, again, the dual aspect of nature itself, of being. It's that of utilizing the right and left hemisphere perceptions and um, trying to look at the whole of the context and, and finding the flow. It's, it's not just rationalism. It's also creativity. It's also uh, meaning found, embedded within um, w within different modes of being and, and stories and, and trying to derive that meaning, you know, becoming too rational, too pragmatic. Ultimately what it does is it, it strips away any meaning and then it creates tyranny and ultimately uh, descends into chaos. And so, and it can be the same thing on the other side having too much meaning, too much creativity and descends into chaos as well. And that's what we see on, on the left side of the spectrum of thought. So, Conscious state of reality, as far as we can tell, reality appears conscious and it appears intelligent and it interacts with us. We interact with it. And it's, it's this continual um, dichotomy of interaction that, manif that reality manifests itself and, and presents itself. And, and we move through that and, and we're constantly trying to interpret reality and, and what's coming at us as it manifests itself. And, and um, sometimes it presents um, tyrannical elements, order elements, and sometimes it presents chaos and, and potential elements. And that's where the yin yang symbol came in and in that middle pathway of representing adaptation through, uh, I have to walk through there. So dark matter and dark energy. It makes up about 80, dark matter makes up about 85% of our universe. So we're only, I think, I think it's visible light in dark energy. And I, I can't remember exactly how much it makes up. I think it's somewhere around like 10%. And then like the remaining five is the visible universe itself. All the lights, all the galaxies, all the stars, all those things that you see only make up constitute about four or 5% of the universe itself. The rest is dark matter and dark energy. And we don't even know what it is. Now, new studies have proposed that maybe extra dimensions are, uh, you know, that, dark matter is a higher dimensional realm acting on our own. And, you know, one of the most prominent uh, theories within uh, theoretical physics right now to describe the essence of reality is that of uh, string theory, which proposes 26 extra dimensions to make mathematical sense of the universe itself. And uh, so, and what's interesting is dark matter is responsible for the, it's a glue to the universe. It's a glue. It, it holds the, the galaxies um, together as they rotate. Um, and it, it holds the whole fabric of, of space time in its place. 
Uh, gravity is too weak of a force for this equalized distribution of the, of, of the galaxy and the stars as such. And we'll see here shortly the certain patterns within nature that, that resemble that of the universe. Very fascinating. And so uh, dark matter may be a higher dimensional realm acting on our own, just keeping everything in place. And it's like, wait a minute here. That, that sounds exactly like what the Bible says. You know, the hand of God fashioned the, the, um, the stars and this and that. And it's that he's the sustainer of all things. And it's that realm, the heavenly realm acting on our own, just holding everything in place and essentially in control of the universe itself. Uh, dark energy is what is responsible for the uh, expansion and acceleration of the universe that we're seeing from the initial big bang. And then it will, it's also perhaps as far as I can tell, responsible for the big crunch, the collapse of the universe upon itself. And the prediction of the several well ago, they believe that it was about 65 to a hundred million years from now, the universe may collapse due to our dark energy, uh, pulling it, retracting it back upon itself. It'll reach a certain point and then pull back. And then, and then it goes back to singularity and merges once again into a new universe. And that's exactly what the Bible says in second Peter, as well as revelations that the old universe will be done away with. It'll melt away, which that's exactly what happens in big crunch because there's other uh, theories as well. Uh, you have the big rip, you have the big freeze, and that's essentially predicated upon the idea of the universe continuing to accelerate in its expansion. Either everything will freeze to death, it'll get cold, and it'll just continue forever in expansion, or it will uh, keep accelerating in expansion due to dark energy, and it'll literally rip the fabric of space-time, and God who knows what'll happen from there. Uh, that's called the big rip, you know, the big freeze. But the most plausible one that most uh, physicists are agreeing upon is that of the crunch, that dark energy will finally keep accelerating, and then it'll finally retract the universe upon itself, in a collapse and then uh, Roger Penrose uh, famous physicist has promoted the idea that maybe it does that it fluctuates and creates another one fluctuate well the Bible says that exactly and so it you know that's correlating with these ideas and what's being empirically gathered so far uh, from observations of the universe and that is subatomic realm as well and um, and so you have to wonder what well, they have that that knowledge 2000 years ago these apostles, where are they getting their knowledge from? You know, the whole idea that uh, kind of going going out on limb here on some of the ideas being promoted uh, promoted by let's say New Ages and things that in agnostics that that really Christ is some alien from some distant star or something of that sort. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense either because he knows the the birth and destruction of the universe. They have all this knowledge that's out that that can only be perceived from outside of space time itself. So these would be more or less higher dimensional uh, beings coming in and out of our, our universe, which that's exactly as far as I can tell what scripture promotes is the idea of uh, ascending and descending out of the higher of the heavenly realm. And so uh, perhaps that's a higher dimensional realm that these um deities entities are uh, coming in and out of and so uh, within the universe i don't think it's plausible i think it's more plausible to state that that christ this information is coming from outside our space-time realm from a higher dimensional realm and um, interacting on the subatomic level and that that information is emerging through the subatomic realm into the conscious consciousness of the prophets and apostles that are writing these things. So therefore a spoken word from God through the essence of reality into the quantum fluctuations occurring within our brains. They're producing consciousness, speaking into there. They're writing it down, giving us information. And it's like this information is coming out from outside the space time the universe. So. Coin laying outside one day and then becoming eternal. That, that's interesting, Joe. Um, yeah, I've never, I never heard had had that heard that one before. As far as finding equilibrium becoming eternal, that's that's pretty interesting. Uh, I know as far as as far as what's promoted in scripture was talking about that it that it will collapse, burn up, and then it emerge this new universe. And even the new universe, I said it before, and we'll get into more of that 
once again at the latter end here. It's the idea that um, even the new universe isn't predicated upon perfection. Even the heavenly realm, this is what people are like, oh yeah, there's no sin in heaven and you know, every, everything's perfect. It's like, no, God is the only perfect one. Christ and God, that, that's the perfect, that's the ideal. The rest of it has um, flaws to a certain extent. And I, I know people hate this. They're like, no, that's wrong. It's like, maybe I am. I, I may be wrong. You're exactly right. But, I, you know, if that were true, if it's so perfect in heaven to a certain extent, and that we're perfect up there, um, think about it. Well, first off, you're, you're perfected. And then what, what do you have to strive for? What meaning can you derive? Uh, it's very difficult to do unless you're God himself. So do we turn into gods? It's like, no, that's not what scripture said. So, you know, it, it, it does state that we kind of become uh, angels, essentially, angelic beings, but that's not God-like. Um, you know, if it was so perfect, then Lucifer would have never fell. Lucifer fell, in, you know, from heaven. He committed sin in heaven. And even in the new universe with the new Jerusalem, it says that nothing that defiled will come be, able, be allowed into the new Jerusalem, implying the idea that, People will still be able to have free will and to make choices and to, you know, commit sin and have to be, uh, you know, um, ostracized for a while, I guess. I, you know, it's it's very complicated. I don't think it's so black and white like we, we interpret it to be. And like I said, I could very well be wrong. Absolutely. 100 percent. But these are things that I have noticed as I'm reading through. I'm like, no. That doesn't make any sense. Everything's going to be perfect and everything. I, we're going to have less of it. Even the words for uh, no more crying is not actually a simple uh, Greek word for crying. Like just, you know, tears. We're, you know, it even says, God says he'll wipe every tear. And then it says, oh, well, there'll be no more crying. Well, why would he wipe away tears if there's no crying? Crying, what it actually means is uh, a, um, perfu a perfusive crying, like a uh, outright uh, uh, del uh deliberate pain and it's the same thing with pain as well it's not actual just simple pain that greek word uses uh an you know, kind of a radicalized form radicalized form of of uh um, excruciating pain not a simple uh everyday pain so there'll still be pain because you need resistance we need resistance as people as humans we need resistance in order to grow and continue to transform because we're never going to be perfect you know, only God is perfect and only him remains perfect. If that were true, if we're going to become perfect like uh, in heaven, then the angels would be near perfect. They're not. They're, they're not perfect either. They even fell from heaven. So it's, you know, it's a very tricky situation. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Joe. Striving towards perfection, yet always just images and shadows of the perfect creator. Yes. And so it always gives meaning. And some purpose and a particular aim in mind, you know, we, we represent that here, even in heaven, it says that we'll be serving God. You know, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean exactly? Are we going to be serving him? You know, I think we're going to have duties to do not in heaven. It says that in the new Jerusalem, in the new universe, we'll be inhabiting a new universe. And it's like, man, this is it's wild stuff. When you really stop to think about it for a second, you're like, wait a minute here. This is uh, a little deeper than and when I initially thought, not so black and white anymore, what are we dealing with? So going back to the higher dimensional realm real quick, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The invisible realm acting on our own, that's exactly what dark matter is. Uh, Hebrews 11, and then again in Colossians, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And, and it goes on and says that all things are contained within him. And so, um, you know, same thing even with Elijah, whenever he wanted the boy to see, the servant boy to see the army of angelic beings that were on the throne, he said, open his eyes, take the veil from his eyes. And, and, you know, he saw this vast angelic army standing on the hilltop. Um, it's, a, um, you know, we only see a particular spectrum of light. So anything outside the spectrum, we cannot perceive, I would say, the higher dimensional realm that's around us. You know, there could be angelic means entities of different sorts all around us and never even know and passing through each other all the time um and scientists have proposed the same thing it's not that far-fetched 
it could be a true reality, you know, parallel universes, so to speak, that are, you know, flowing right through us. And we have no clue that they're even there and nor that, you know, well, they know we're there, of course, because they're interacting with us within the stories. And so, um, yeah. So, and we see this working itself out in science. That's what's so fascinating. This wonderful thing. So then God said, let there be a permanent in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the permanent and uh, divided the waters which were under the permanent from the waters which were above the permanent. And it was so, and God called the permanent heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. And a lot of people are like, well, that's the uh, water um, uh, within the atmosphere that caused the flood. Perhaps it was, but oh, no, I actually went a little too far. I'm trying to get back to his, his deal. And I'm messing up right now. Hang on. There we go. So day two, 7 billion, uh, 7.7 7 billion years ago to 3.7 billion years ago. So now the days are becoming shorter um, you're, you're, as far as years go. Now you're looking at only a stretch of 4 billion years difference. The heavenly firmness form, a uh, scientific description of this and Milky Way form, sun, main sequence of SARS form. So the sun, he believes, is already being formed within the second day. And what happens on the fourth day uh, is a revealing of the sun uh, from the expulsion, dissipation of the um, atmosphere. But our atmosphere was uh, much cloudier at that time. I can't remember. I It's been a few years since I've read this book. It's a fascinating book. I read it a couple of times. So some books I'll read twice just to get as much information as I can out of it. And uh, so, and I've been so busy with school, I couldn't really go through it as much again to be for the show, unfortunately. But I highly recommend, I even have the link to the book in my description. So I highly recommend checking that out. Great work. I, I love these kind of works because it's really, it brings in new ideas and allows us to think. But here's the universe. You see the visible universe um, going on right here, of course. It's beautiful. I, I love looking at uh, photos from space and deep space. It's just beautiful, majestic images. And, and again, that also shows that uh, duality of nature. Um, and, and you see that in physics as well. You have general relativity that governors the big things, big objects like this, and you have quantum mechanics, which governors the subatomic realm. And so um, and the uh, dichotomy of chaos and order, we see the this is like the order um, essence of reality. Everything has this majestic view. You see it in the mountains, you see it in space, you see all these wonderful um, uh, images that are coming into our, our, that we're perceiving in our, in our brains and, and processing it. But then if you, once you get on the, on the deep fundamental level of what's making all this happen, it's literally utter chaos, just potential and particles everywhere emerging. And you can't predict the exact location. And it, it's just, it's a phenomenal. And so that's the chaos ordered economy of, of reality. And so it's, it's, and it's amazing how people had that information thousands of years ago and how exactly. Um, so without, I think, something teaching them, telling them whether through, whether through a, a um, direct um, divine interaction, like we see with uh, the stories where angelic beings are appearing, or through consciousness itself, where we see some of the prophets writing it down and being told by God through their minds. Uh, through their brains and, and i think you know that makes perfect sense as well because we use quantum processing and perhaps use quantum processing and our brains are made of particles and, and so the higher as i said the higher dimensional realm as it's sending information maybe sending it through those particles into our brains and we see that even happen with even our simple computers uh using it through programs through numbers and uh, codes and it's it's and then it manifests a picture and yet underneath all that is this, you know, lines of codes that are going on. So um, the same pattern. And, and again, uh, sorry, um, right here, as far as the patterns of the universe, one, uh, first off on the right hand side here, that that's the universe. These are neural pathways in your brain. You see a similar pattern going on with the structure of the universe and the structure of your brain. 
it's fascinating. It's like, you know, all these similar patterns emerging, um, both on a large scale and on a much smaller scale, the human brain in comparison to the universe, the structure of the universe, same patterns, similar patterns. In now. So day three, earth land formation. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed and the fruit tree and that yields fruit according to his kind whose seed is in its in and of itself um in is in itself on the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth grass and herb that yield seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind and god saw that it was good so the evening and the morning were the third day uh so remember the days that, that he is promoting uh are days that are um very long they're extended over billions and millions of years and, and they get shorter again so now we're kind of getting more into and uh, into the earth scope rather than a universal uh, universal cosmic perception how that perception has dwindled down to earth and so the years again now it's from 3.7 billion years to 1.7 billion years um oceans and dry land appear the first live plants appear um and it goes on. He also references the Kabbalah a little bit, which I know people are skeptical of that, but he, he uses some outside references going on. Uh, he's not a Kabbalist himself. It's just he uses reference Kabbalah states this marked only the start of plant life, which then developed during the following days. But he goes on scientific description. The earth is cooled and large bodies of water appear 3.8 billion years ago, followed almost immediately by first forms of life, bacteria and photosynthetic algae. So we have the first plant life representing algae. Um, emerging uh, you and multicellular uh, organisms coming into play um, and that's where these fossils that I had reference here oh now I'm getting way ahead, ahead of myself here okay so yeah that's what so this is the algae and this is some uh, multicellular um, deals I, I'm trying to remember I think that's that fossil is a billion with the algae is a billion years old. Now that's 550 million years old for the multicellular. And then you have the uh, what the earth looked like. I believe that's two billion years ago. If I'm not mistaken. So the land itself, um, that's one side of the earth. This is the other side. And then at one point, I, and I, if I'm not mistaken, about 250 million years ago, it's all one. They, you know, that all came into one supercontinent called, uh, called Pangea, if I'm not mistaken. And so, so these are long. So now we have the sun and the moon, day four. So prior to this, you don't have the sun and the moon as far as a young earth creationist view because it's not even created until day four. So you have no 28, 24 hour days and it doesn't make any sense. But looking at this from not a literal um, view, but rather a poetic view and trying to pick out the data and, and figure out where everything fits and correlate that map it on onto. And I think that's also why, again, why a lot of young people are like, well, none of that's really actually true. It's just poetic and it's meaningful. And that's really what you do. And, and it's like, no, no, you know, it's, it, trust me. I think, I think there's some um, objective um, information that's being presented to us. And so, at the corner. <laughs> okay, I was just looking at this comment. I saw Joe's comment. He's a all the God's created is letters glory and and uh it's the same as scientific understanding leave our grace. Amen. That's for sure. But I was looking at this comment coming from YouTube. It's kinda kinda crazy. This guy, Wesley Curry too. Uh it would turn lost uh, like ball and remember those breathless. And then it said, Jesus heard my prayer to heal two teeth in your mouths. The core foundation of your arguments, you are liars and haters of the truth. Good luck. How many Mark, did your faith shall not be fun for you? Okay, well, man, that's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm a liar. Presenting new information being a liar, that's that's for sure. Yeah, don't think outside anything at all. Give yourself constricted. That's, that's a great approach. <laughs> um so 
anyways, the sun and moon says, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so Then God made the um, also uh, Hebrew word and God, which can mean to uh, redistribute, reprocess the way he describes it a lot better than I am. That's for sure. But Two great light, uh, made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good for the evening and morning was the fourth day. So there's no sun or moon on the young creation side to support the case. And so, you know, it's, and it's funny too, because they'll, they'll I, I mean, they get hard and heavy with defending this idea, the interpretation. I'm I'm not trying to defend an interpretation. I'm just telling you, this is kind of what scientific evidence presents. And to state that all the evidence, all the facts that they're presenting are deceptive, it, it's hard for me to believe because it's like they're observing, they're collecting data and they're putting that data in and, and they're interpreting it as such. And, and to state that Every single scientist and the vast majority of scientists are all corrupt and it's all a corrupt system. Kind of goes back to the flat earth idea that it's like all the pilots, you know, are corrupt. All the, it's like that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And, uh, you know, flat earth, and I know people believe that as well. And that's just fine, I guess. But I mean, there's no evidence to support that. I mean, you look at every object in the universe itself, it's all globally. And so it doesn't make any sense that the earth wouldn't be. And, you know, they're like, well, and again, they take the literal, like I said, these people will take literal interpretations of what's found. I believe it's in Psalm, if I'm mistaken, where the earth is held up by the four pillars. And, uh, you know, and they'll use that as a, as a reference. I'm like, that's poetic. But then you'll take something from Christ and it says, move this mountain from here to there as, as figurative. And it's like, well, I'm trying to make sense of it. Maybe I'm just perceiving it wrong. Maybe you do have it right. I don't know, but it just doesn't really add up logically following uh, as far as that goes. And so, um, so, you know, they for the solution of so young. That's what it's our atmosphere to the moon. I doesn't mean the night sky was never visible. Um, yeah, well, that that's what I was, uh, was going to get at, Joe, is, is he goes on uh, here with day four, 1.7 billion years to 750 uh, million years ago. Um, it says Earth's atmosphere became become transparent. Photosynthesis produced oxygen-rich atmosphere. So you finally have a transparency in the atmosphere. Prior to that, there was a lot of gases. I believe methane-rich uh, gases in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, but... And then that slowly uh, dissipated, especially as multicellular life became uh, more abundant and algae began to present itself and it began to breathe, uh, you know, breathe in more common carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen and things of that nature. It began to transform the earth in that process. And that's exactly what we find. And, and so the sun and moon were there. They were being... Uh, it just, it became finally transparent where on the earth perspective, you could finally actually see the sun and the moon because the, the transparency of the atmosphere itself. Um, so that's what it promotes. It's very fascinating. I just find this work very fascinating in conjunction with uh, scientific evidence that we have. And so, okay, now day five. Now, this is where it gets interesting, too, because people are like, oh, there's no dinosaurs ever referenced in the Bible. Well, that's not necessarily true. And God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, every living thing that moves with which the waters abound, abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them. Then be fruitful, and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. You know, there's an interesting thing for me on the created side. You know, how did God create things? And, you know, we, we talk about creation. We always think of, you know, I think this is a problem too, especially in our modern day, uh, the way our modern, uh, modern day brains work and, and function on the left hemisphere, more on the left hemisphere, is that 
everything is mechanical. But even the universe itself, as far as we can tell, is not mechanical. It's uh, it's more rooted in quantum fluctuation, which is not mechanical by no stretch of the imagination. And uh, and so, if it is a quantum computer running, let's say hypothetically, that it is a quantum computer running the system that we inhabit, it's like, is it programs that God would be using? You would say uh, that quote unquote creates uh these um beings and evolutionarily speaking that would make sense because it then it's programmed into the essence of reality and it brings forth and we'll see that here on day six where it says the earth brought forth uh the creatures and so that goes right along with um with evolution especially after the um extinction of the dinosaurs that we'll get into here shortly 65 million years ago but it's interesting because so we had the dinosaurs and of course people are like, well, it's just, you know, um, it's uh, aquatic animals that he's speaking of when that's exactly how the dinosaurs actually began was in, uh, in the ocean, in the waters. And then they slowly progress into land, uh, more land animals as it went. And so, um, he says that that's kind of where he's going and that this day is again, it's a long day and it's a, it's almost like a program emerging these animals. So interesting thing is the word used there for uh, great sea creatures is also translated wells. Um, but it's, uh, the Hebrew word tannin. So I want to look, there's three different words here. And well, one of them, this is a root of tannin. So we focus on tannin. Um, Tenin, I think is how it's actually pronounced, but it, it's actually uh, translated most often as dragon. So he created the great dragons. And that, that's what's fascinating about this whenever you look at it. And then you look at it, the evolutionary scale of what evolutionists are, are promoting on how, how it all works. It, it coincides permanent maps onto the story of Genesis very well. It's like, yeah, it started as sea creatures, emerged on land. You know, over the course of millions of years, and it's these dinosaur creatures, you know, because even the dinosaurs, you have the mosasaurus. The only reason I know these things as well is because my son is very big in the dinosaurs. <laughs> so it, it, it helped educate me a little bit. Um, but yeah, the mosasaurus, which is large, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the largest uh, sea creature to ever exist was the mosasaurus. And, um, and, you know, that was the first introduction of large uh dinosaur type creatures as the millions of years and it goes from gosh i don't even know the cretaceous period i believe into the jurassic period you see you know t-rexes and things of that nature really become prominent and so he believes that day five encompasses that entire time from the time of the uh first sea creatures because that's where the creature actually came from was water and then went on to dry land and um, and that the actual land animals are are actually references to the first the introduction of uh, mammals, mammalian species that dominated the earth following the extinction of the dinosaurs of 65 million years ago. And we'll get into that. It's very interesting as well. So dragon serpent is actually what tannin is a tannin is uh, most oftentimes translated as. And uh, uh, whenever Moses throws his staff down before Pharaoh. The staff turns into a tannin. It doesn't turn into, uh, uh, and, you know, you can translate it to serpent, but uh, the serpent, even in um, the Garden of Eden, is actually Nahash in Hebrew. And that's actually translated as serpent uh, 31 different times in the Bible, a snake. And so this, this is very interesting. It's, it can be translated as serpent as well and translated three different times, according to our translation, uh, serpent for tannin. But the root of tannin is tan, and it's uh, it's um, well, it's translated once as well. But it's oftentimes, the actual outline of the Bible usage is dragon, maybe the extinct dinosaur, the uh, plesiosaurus, uh, and also be translated well. Um, so sea serpent, uh, huge marine dragon. So it's very interesting. Um, it kind of makes you think for a second. It's like okay, so if you were translated from that type of uh, perception and translation, you could translate the great dragons, um, created the great dragons. And so we have uh, mammals. And, you know, it's very interesting, too, on the young creationist side. And I'm not, 
And I'm, again, I'm not bashing or arguing necessarily against them. I'm just proposing different ideas that maybe we can actually take into consideration here within the church instead of just limiting ourselves. And then, you know, we talk about how atheists limit themselves and they're possessed by the ideas. Like, no, you, you all are. And maybe if we actually work together, we'd figure something out for once. And so um, me, I'm just trying to promote an idea here. And most of the evidence I have seen for the young creationists are just doesn't add up and uh even with the fossil record they they use uh they're like oh yeah there's footprints over here actually not far from where i live over here in glen Roach, texas i'm like oh those are footprints next to dinosaur prints but actually going to find out those are not footprints human footprints at all those are actually another dinosaur footprint that has uh three claws that sunk into the mud that concaved itself and uh kind of done away with the claw portion and looks and mimics that of a human footprint, but they're not actually footprint. They're another dinosaur footprint walking through the mud. And young earth creationists have said, oh no, see that's human footprints. It's not at all actually. And, um, you know, same thing with uh, one of the other fossils that has a human footprint next, or kind of in, overlapping a dinosaur footprint, but a handprint overlapping dinosaur uh, footprint, but uh, they've, uh, falsified that showing that it actually wasn't real uh, and and there's no way of making it it was actually fashion more than it was something that was brought up and anyway so and I, it may be true of course that doesn't really distort the belief at all but what i'm trying to point out is the strict fact that maybe our interpretations are wrong maybe let's look at the data let's see how that data maps on maybe it maps on a little better than what we actually think and so Thankfully, we have someone that's done a lot of that work with Gerald Schroeder. And, and, you know, I mean, if you want to stay in and, you know, believe in young, that's great. It shouldn't, you know, the overall message, of course, is Christ. But I'm just trying to present these ideas, especially for the younger generation that is scientifically minded, that's atheistic in nature, and that, you know, atheistic in belief. And that, you know, maybe you take a consideration here real quick. This maps on pretty well with the word. And then maybe this actually, you know, according to your perception that science being real, maybe maybe the word is real. Maybe Christ is real. Maybe we need to really start thinking these things through a little bit more serious, you know, take it seriously instead of just saying, well, it's just mythology that's been created. It's like maybe so, but it doesn't appear that way. Actually, there's a lot of evidence to support that it appears very real. And we're starting to discover that scientifically speaking. You know, with the complexity of the universe and so on, it's not so mechanical. It's not two-dimensional. It's it's multi-dimensional, and, and things are very complex. And we need to take these in deep consideration, and some you know pushing it off as though it's just pure mythology. Uh, that's for sure. So, um, and Joe, our eternal Creator, and God said these things. Uh, like let there be light beginning but also an eternity program idea is a good compa uh, comparison i think of it as god starting to snowball rain down from the beginning and he knew how big it would get and where it would yeah no I, absolutely joe so i don't know and it's things considered that's for sure so mammals and humans day six and god said let the earth bring forth the living creature again like i said the earth bring forth so it's almost it's all a program rather than um and again it says and god made the beasts of the earth so it's not using the word creator, bara in Hebrew. But the earth bring forth according to the kind, cattle, creeping thing, and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over uh, every creeping thing. A creature on the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them then god blessed them and god said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth and god said see i have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food also to every beast of the earth to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so, then God said everything, uh, saw everything they made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, um, 
before I continue on to uh, explain this a little bit. Now, a lot of scholars believe that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are actually separate accounts. And I don't believe that. I believe they actually flow. And we're going to go into that, especially into next week, but even a little bit here today. I believe they flow together. Um, and you know, especially empirically speaking, scientifically, if you look at it. Very interesting, especially with the rise of the consciousness. I believe that things are flowing. What being spoken of here, and especially with, in, in accordance with uh, Gerald Schroeder's work, is the fact that um, we're seeing the emergence of chimpanzees come into play. That's what we're seeing, the very first chimps that evolved later on into humans. I'm telling you, I know a lot of people don't like this. Like, oh, no, you know, uh, you know, we didn't evolve from monkeys. And they, it's, it's almost like derogatory to even suggest such things. I'm telling you, it, looking at human evolution uh, and looking at the fossil record is actually very interesting. I'm going to get into some of it here in a minute. It's actually very interesting process it's not so straightforward uh there's a lot of unknowns and and especially with the increase of intelligent and conscious awareness that's the thing that really intrigued me the most about human evolution it's like wow and then you look at like i said take human evolution and look at it on put that into an individual's life and you look at um from the evolution from the time that they're uh, born till the time that they're uh older i mean it maps on pretty well it's like the same similar patterns and even the ideas of transformation on the individual side and you take human evolution how we actually increase in in uh overall intelligence and complexities and tool making things of that nature over the millions of years and in the past several thousand years and and how uh we've gotten smarter much more intelligent as time has passed on and it's it's very interesting how now all of a sudden we're beginning to regress, evolutionarily speaking, in the past uh, three or four decades. I mean, you you look at uh, IQ rates, especially here in America, you look at testosterone rates, you look at all these different variables that are in play, we're steadily declining as a, uh, as a species and as a society. And uh, they, to me, I like using that argument first off with people that are like, oh yeah, see thing, we're right, you know, we're doing things right, our ideas, are right. That's essentially what they're stating on them, especially on the left. They're like, oh no, our ideas are right. Well, if they're so right, then the data should, should, um, you know, map onto that pretty, pretty well. And it doesn't at all. It's like, no, we're actually regressing as a species. Here's, I can show you how we've all made all these advancements. Now we're regressing and we're actually going to become extinct if we continue in the same pattern. And, uh, and we can think, you know, some of that far and partial due to the elites, of course, and the, uh, that of uh, fossil fuels, uh, pollution, and uh, plastics, everything that we're consuming that's lowering testosterone, that's impairing cognitive function, that's only part of it. That's not even the whole of the equation. We'll, get in, we'll try to get into that as we get more towards the second coming of Christ at the end of the series. But there, it's, it's, it's pretty wild, especially, and I think, I, I think of it in counter-argumentative ways, looking at, their arguments, well, maybe it's true. Maybe they're right. Let's keep it on my mind. Maybe they're right. Okay, well, if they're right, and then it would map on pretty well. You would have evidence supporting your case that you are right, that your ideas that you're promoting, their theories in and of themselves, hypothesis, theories, you know, maybe they're right. Okay, well, then empirical data doesn't support your case whatsoever. So you're apparently you're not right. Whatever you're doing is wrong. And, uh, and so it was really fascinating, too. I know this, I know kind of went on a long time here, but really fascinating. I watched a video from Joe Rogan the other day, and I don't know how true it is. I want to actually do a little bit more research. He was saying he had a uh, historian on that was stating that um, the end of every civilization that you have seen from ancient time, um, transgenderism was actually one of the uh, finishing products of the collapse of civilization, of the Roman Empire, of, of all these different empires. I don't know how true that is, but he stated that. I was like, wow, I want to look that up. He said gender fluidity, ultimately, uh, you know, you get to the point where a system progresses so much and then they finally get to the point of collapse, of chaos, essentially, and just deteriorates. Uh, you become so creative that it, it loses its structure, essentially. And it collapses. And I was like, wow, I mean, that makes sense. So I, I kind of want to do a little bit of research, see how true that actually was. And uh, so that was kind of fascinating work. Okay, going back up here for day six here uh land animals uh 
Oh, okay. And again, I didn't look at day five. Day five, first multicellular animals, water swarm, uh, water swarm with uh, animal life, having the basic body plans of all future animals, winged insects appear. And then you have uh, day six, which encompasses 250 million years ago to approximately, he believes 6,000, but I don't really agree with his assessment on Adam and Eve. I believe it's uh, much earlier than that. We'll get into that more next week, but we'll get into a little bit of here today. Massive extinction destroys over 90% of life. Land is repopulated, hominids, and then humans. So um, at 65 million years ago, we have the, distinct, and the extinction of 90% um, uh, of life. You have, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. You have from an asteroid that hits Earth, actually uh, near the Gulf of Mexico, actually kind of in the Gulf of Mexico. And since Hawkwave, you have um, global temperature drop drastically from the impact, global, uh, the whole Earth. And what emerged from that was actually smaller creatures, uh, more uh, mammalian, rather than reptilian. And you, so these are some of the earliest forms of the mammalians that uh, evolved around 65 million years ago after the extinction of the dinosaurs. Yeah, this is one of the very first chimpanzees that evolved 65 million years ago, it had no tail. And then, of course, you have woolly mammoths, those are the large mammals that came into existence. They have a bunch of rhinos, all kinds of different things at the time. The early humans, we'll uh, get a little bit more in, into here. The very first real bipedal hominid. Now, some estimates have been around six million years ago that we began to walk bipedally. Uh, that means upright versus uh, bipedal um, primates. Uh, but this right here is in Austria. I'm going to try my best to say this. Austri Australopithecus, I believe I'm saying that correctly. Um, it's one of the earliest forms of, of humans, hominids. Uh, of our ancestors around four million years ago. So the famous fossil of Lucy, that, that's an Australopithecus. Uh, I'm saying that correctly. And um, they were already doing tool making. Um, strangely enough, they're walking upright, they're doing tool making. Uh, they were more or less scavengers, so they uh, went after um, leftover meat from hyenas or whatever it may be. They emerged in Africa. Uh, and what I'm getting at here with Adam and Eve story, we'll get to next week with the emergence consciousness, is that Adam and Eve weren't necessarily the first humans. They were the very first fully conscious humans. And uh, we'll and we'll go through this as best I can. I'm going to touch into this next week as well, because I know we're pretty far into this as far as I go. This is Homo erectus. So this kind of gives you a visual of what Homo erectus started losing a lot of body hair um which they do not know why we were losing body hair it really actually makes no sense body hair was actually what kept us cool during summer and warm in the winter protect us from sunlight we don't know why we shed our skin uh, our skin our, our hair we had no earthly idea exactly why but um we began to lose hair homo erectus we began to appear more human-like as as we went on and uh, our heads actually began to expand so our brains began to expand and um, we uh, discovered fire around two million years ago, and they emerged about two, million, uh, two, two and a half million years ago. Uh, it was the first Homo erectus, and um, they uh, discovered fire. And, well, either discovered it or, uh, yeah, anyway, discovered fire, and they began to cook. And, uh, and I believe that was, we discovered fire around two and a half, 2.2 million years ago. And we began to cook our food. And what that did is it expanded our brain. This is a theory now. And I cannot remember the guy's name, but it's called Catching Fire. Um, the name of the book. And he describes how we chewed on meat and leaves and things of that nature, uh, raw meat, uh, for about six hours a day. That's what chimpanzees, they chew on meat and leaves and stuff for about six hours total a day. And uh, gorillas are about eight hours of chewing leaves and meat uh, every day. And so it's a lot of chewing, a lot of digestive processes you have to go through. Well, what fire did is it tenderized our meat and it allowed us to spend less time chewing and more time doing things. 
and he believed what happened in uh, so we consume and it's much easier to digest compared to raw raw meat and so it, we're able to chew it a lot quicker process it a lot more efficiently and we were able to um, uh, spend more time actually doing things and creating things and thinking so over the millions of years we began to expand our brains even more so and this right here is the neanderthal and so between tool making bipedalism and uh fire those are three prominent ways of expand uh, that we expanded our intelligence our brains and ultimately our intelligence and as well as self-awareness and um they uh what else was it um so yeah tool tool making did that and as well as the fact as we began to branch out of africa we began to branch out if i'm a second one one and a half million <clears throat> one and a half million years ago i believe it's when from what i can remember correctly we began to emerge out of africa and explore and walking upright the bipedalism factor um what it did is it it actually changed our perception uh we um our whole visual field so before we were crawling on the ground and we uh, were extending our necks upward and what bipedalism does is it tilted our head forward to where our perceptual uh, view uh field of vision was much different we weren't looking down on the ground and having to extend forward and it also dropped our larynx down to where we began to vocalize and that may have helped uh produce speech essentially um and there's much more into it i i can go a, as we go along with this especially next week with the idea of the emergence of consciousness full full-fledged consciousness and um where the garden of eden is located and and you know evidence that supports uh, uh adam and eve and things of that nature will be presented next week and so it's very fascinating stuff but anyway so um yeah our tool making became more complex over time as well and uh, yeah, human evolution, bipedalism, tool making, fire and cooking, and then later on art. So we uh, we see arts being represented as well in uh, seashells and jewelry. Uh, but that was more with Neanderthals and as well as cave paintings. Neanderthals uh, have some cave paintings, but ultimately Homo sapiens uh, did cave paintings and that, that's us, uh, modern humans to a certain extent. Uh, we emerged around 300,000 years ago. So <clears throat> if, if you can see it, that's 300 the Asha, uh, Pathith, uh, Australia's Pathithicus. I think I'm saying that correct. It's right about here. And uh, yeah, right in here. And so see um, the picture a while ago that I shared. And yeah, right here. And the cranium itself is much more um, narrowed down, flatter, um, uh, much more pronounced um, brow ridge. And so what happened is our, our bipedalism and cooking and food and everything and tool making it began to act better range to where our heads became more elongated and so you can see right here more boborious uh, kind of like a, a light bulb you can see that's the description i'm using so it went from a flatter cranium Th this down here is even i'm not even sure if i can yeah this one down here is one of the earliest representations that's sent back again to about uh, six and a half million years ago when i said before may have been the first actual bipedal uh, primate but we're not really certain there's some evidence to suggest, suggest that we'll go into some of that next time but see how flat the cranium is and then it gets a little bit more boborious here and same thing it just keeps getting they're making more room for the brain to expand and we became more and more intelligent as time went on which also made us more conscious, more self-aware. And so here's Oldowan, um, Echelian, I believe, uh, Mysterian. And uh, so you see the markers here, two and a half uh, million years ago, we began to make stone tools. And these are some of the prototypes. And you see it evolved and became more sophisticated as we advanced and became more intelligent and more conscious over time. And that actually, it, not only did we advance our tool making, but tool making in and of itself helped us advance as well. So it's reciprocal uh, in nature. So, um, okay, rest the seventh day, that's the heaven and the earth, and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God in his work, which he had done, and he rests on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. 
This brings in chapter two, which we'll continue on next week. So then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. This is the history of the heaven and the earth uh, when they were created in the day of the Lord, uh, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plant in the field was in the earth. This is interesting. It says, uh, created in the day that made the earth and before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. But the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his uh, nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, my interpretation of this in correlation with human evolution, first off, 65 million years ago was when the first grasses really began to emerge on earth. We had plant life and some grasses, but the vast majority of the grasses that we know emerged 65 after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So from the ashes of that world that existed before of the dinosaurs and things of that nature, um, the grasses of the field began to grow. And then uh, at the same time, from the uh, as far as making the man from the dust of the ground, uh, it makes me think of the very first chimpanzees that emerged 65 million years ago. And that began the whole evolutionary pathway for hominids and for human evolution itself to go on and, and to emerge as us over that long process. But again, these processes 65 million years in eternal perspective may only be short span time uh, span of time so um these are just you know ideas that i'm promoting here it's not necessarily i'm saying yes this is what it is it's just strictly presenting some evidence presenting some different ideas again check out the books um i there's several books that i've recommended in the description you got signs of god by Gerald scroger you have uh, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist by uh, Frank Turek and Norman Geisler, uh, as well as Francis Collin, uh, The Language of God Dealing with DNA. Uh, so those are some of the books that you can check out. Highly recommend. Um, and I'll each week I'll try to re recommend different books that kind of correlate with uh, certain topics that were on at that time. So next week we'll go further into the emergence of, uh, we'll go further into human evolution and the emergence of consciousness within human presented uh, within the Garden of Eden and um, and how it's, I believe it's multi-layered, it's layered on top of each other is what's happening. These stories are very complex and very compact, compacted. And then it goes just like, and it mimics the pattern of, of the expansion of the universe from the Big Bang, as far as I can tell. Uh, you could do, do a comparison, map that on pretty well with the word of God itself from the Bible. You have very compacted, very radical, a lot of things happening within these stories. And then as time goes on, once you get into Noah and you get into uh, Abraham and time itself begins to um, slow down, things begin to expand. The stories begin to expand. It's not so compacted, it's not so layered. And uh, it, it, it mimics a lot of what uh, the cosmic evolutionary pathway uh, mimics. So kind of an interesting uh, comparison going on there. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to support uh, my work, you can on do donating to PayPal or uh, Venmo as well. And also have Patreon if you want to check that out. Links are in the description. Uh, really appreciate it. Please like and share. And I uh, look forward to next week with the emergence of human consciousness and the story of Adam and Eve. We're going to look at historical evidence, archaeological evidence to support that story, that it is a real story, and that I think it's much more complex than what we're making it out to be. So uh, we'll see exactly how all that works next week. Thank you all. I really appreciate your support for tuning in and staying on as long as these uh, uh, studies are. So really appreciate it. Have a wonderful week ahead and God bless.